napoleon and the wasp he tore open the telegram exclaimed thank god clapped his hat on slammed the door in my face and was gone all inside a minute what had happened that he had forgotten me i screamed with rage and disappointment and scratched at the door a thing i rarely do for nothing makes human beings so annoyed as to have their doors marked by dogs the cook and the waitress came running from the kitchen they were very good friends of mine for i took care to treat them with the respect and consideration that every well-bred dog should show to servants i always wiped my feet on muddy days and i never went into the kitchen without an invitation bless the beast what's up with him exclaimed cook something you may be sure said the waitress he's got sense that dog has i guess the old man has gone and left him i pulled cook's cotton dress with my teeth i led her to the telegram and nosed it over to her alas i could not read it that bit of paper had driven master from his home cook caught it up and then gave a screech she's gone and done it doesn't that jostle you what had who done mistress i supposed why didn't she tell me i whined and howled but they paid no attention to me till lewis came in for his orders as he usually did at this time in the morning not sauntering but hurrying and breathing heavily as if he too were excited there was a queer smirk on his face and he opened his mouth to speak but he had no chance to say anything for the two women just yelled at him we've got a baby we're just like other folks read that ain't it the super fine now i thought i would go crazy i barked and jumped and screamed and no one rebuked me cook sat down in mistress's chair and fanned herself with her apron annie the waitress took master's chair and drummed her fingers on the table and lewis sat on the fender stool with his cap on and whistled let's have our coffee in here said cook so they had a lovely time by the fire and talked about the coming of the baby and how it would turn the family topsy-turvy the old man wasn't in last night was he remarked lewis no said cook he wasn't something new for him that kid elevator boy gave me some mouth about it said lewis sheepishly what did he say asked annie grinned like a fool and asked me where my old man got that dust on his coat and hat i whined eagerly oh if i could only speak and tell them it was cathedral dust rich people don't know what sharp-eyed critics they have in their dogs and cats and servants i hope you gave him a smack said annie bet your life didn't i said lewis says i young fella if my old man was out all night he in no mischief were he ain't that color see and i digged him under the ribs cook and annie shrieked with laughter and said they'd have their dig at the elevator boy too then finally they all went to their work cook invited me politely to sit in the kitchen but after my breakfast i ran to master's room and sat on the window seat looking up and down the drive i waited for him till late in the afternoon then i knew he would be better pleased to have me taking the air 
so i ran to the hall door and barked till annie opened it the elevator boy took me down below and the doorman let me out on the sidewalk it was a pleasant day with a brisk wind sweeping in off the hudson many nurses and children were out and many dogs i knew all the canines in this neighborhood by sight now and had a speaking acquaintance with all those worth knowing i ran into one of the little parks and there saw a group of dogs without leashes who were standing talking together and gazing at a dachshund who was conceitedly staring in what he thought was the direction of germany but what was really hoboken good afternoon boys i said what's the news we're just deciding which of us shall have the pleasure of licking that hyphenated american dog said a handsome black french bulldog for days he's been pushing that griffin bruxelles about and some of us think it's time for us to stand up for the belgian dog to-day the news of the war has been very good for the germans and the dachshund has been positively unbearable i'd like to have the honor of settling him said an irish wolfhound but the odds wouldn't be even a scottish terrier bristled up i mauna conna weena yield the privilege to none i have it it's mine said a welsh terrier angrily i burst out laughing fight him if you like you'll fight me after they stared at me and the dachshund threw me a grateful glance this is a free country for dogs as well as men i said let him talk don't listen if you don't like what he says are you a pro-german inquired an english bulldog furiously if you are i'll chew you up an irish terrier seconded him in reality i am a dog that is for the allies but i wouldn't give them the satisfaction of telling them gentlemen dogs i said i'm not talking about who i'm for or who i'm against you should say whom interjected an english setter who was a great purist as regards dog language thank you i said bowing to him i'm for free speech say what you like as long as you're not insulting he was insulting said the whole group of dogs he said that riverside drive would soon be german that's not insulting i replied why that's flattering think what a nice place it must be if the germans want it every dog showed his teeth i don't know what the upshot would have been if their various owners had not called them and put their muzzles on while we had been gossiping the ladies had been talking together they were very nice ladies and law-abiding in general but they did so hate the muzzle law and were so sorry to see their poor dogs pawing their noses in misery that they had the habit of carrying the muzzles in their hands and slipping them on the dogs when they saw a policeman coming it certainly was absurd to see baby spaniels and toy dogs of all kinds with muzzles on their tiny noses they couldn't have bitten hard if they had tried as the dogs who had been growling about the dachshund left they threw furious backward glances at the conceited little scamp who ran up to me and licked gratefully a little piece of mud off my back donkashane he murmured can't you control yourself a bit i asked and not be so indiscreet 
there wasn't a german dog in that crowd you'd have had a bite or two if i hadn't come along it was for the fatherland he exclaimed and the sacred domestic hearth prized by dogs as well as men you say that like a little parrot i remarked and i don't believe you bullied that griffin on your own responsibility you've always been a good dog up to within a week who's been coaching you the little dog instead of answering looked mad and nipped me quite quickly on the hind leg oh you saucy hyphen i said his name was grosswater leinchen and i rolled him over and over a few times in the dust like a little four-legged worm he got up looking very dusty and shook himself who's been debauching you i said fiercely come on now i can bite as well as any dog and i showed him two rows of strong teeth if i make new friends it's no business of yours he said sulkily oh ho i said i know now it's that new german police dog that has come to the drive so he told you the patter about the domestic hearth now i'll tell you something more he's a stranger he doesn't fit in here you're a new yorker and subject to the law of the drive which is that a dog must function i don't know what that is he said irritably why you've got to fit in here and play the game you must respect the rights of other dogs and not impose your little dachshund will on us did you ever hear of liberty equality fraternity no he said in an ugly little voice that told me the spell of the police dog was still upon him well i said for you that means that if the griffin gets here first and wants the warmest patch of sunlight you've got to let him have it you've no business to drive him out but i'm a bigger dog he said in surprise and i'm german he's only a belgian oh ho that's it is it i replied you think german dogs lead the universe of course they do well then if they do they ought to be perfect they are perfect he said in astonishment didn't you know that no i said i didn't i believed american dogs and english dogs and even colored dogs are just as good as german dogs if they behave themselves you're a socialist he said a dangerous dog i stared at his ridiculous little short-legged swagger as he swung up and down before me now i'm going to tell you something i said as force alone appeals to you that little griffin belongs as you probably know to mrs warrington whose sister married an englishman lord allstone now i happen to know that lady allstone is to arrive here to-morrow on a visit to her sister and with her ladyship comes her english mastiff you're probably going to get the greatest licking a dog ever got for the griffin and the mastiff are always very chummy and he will be sure to tell of the treatment he has been receiving from you a family dog will fight you far harder than outsiders like the drive dogs the dachshund looked alarmed i'm sorry for you i said alvida zane i say he exclaimed hopping after me i don't want to be torn to pieces how can you be i retorted you're perfect being a super dog you'll find a way out if that mastiff hurts me 
the police dog will kill him he said angrily ah perhaps i observed of course the police dog is a good size but an english mastiff the dachshund looked still more thoughtful i believe i'll let the griffin have the sunny corner in future he said after all i'm not living in germany i'll tell the police dog i've got to be american as long as i'm here if i go back to germany i can be german all right i said heartily that's a wise dog now why don't you run right on to the griffin's house and tell him that get your story in before the mastiff arrives off hopped mr dachshund across the drive keeping a bright lookout for policemen and i felt that in future he would be friendly with the griffin i chuckled to myself as i ran on to the bonstones for that was my objective point evil communications corrupt good manners even in dogs the air was delicious i had no muzzle on so i went slowly and with a wary eye for those nice men the police who would be our best friends if it weren't for the health commissioner it is a great fashion with some persons to run down policemen i always like them and firemen and have no admiration whatever for soldiers i hate to see things torn and mangled policemen and firemen try to keep things together and i believe if every policeman in every big city had a good police dog there would be less killing and wounding of human beings the new york policemen are sharp so i had to do a good deal of dodging behind pillars and in shrubbery and twice i had to run away down to the river bank to elude them it was close on dinner time when i reached the bonstone mansion i ran round to the back to get in fortunately the chauffeur who was a friend of lewis knew me and when i whined he left the car he was cleaning in the garage and opening a side door of the house said run in perp i'll bet you've come to call on the bride i had and i ran through back halls and passages right up to her bedroom she was dressing not for her own dinner only but for a fancy dress ball to be held in the house of a friend afterward she looked like the most beautiful picture i ever saw most women don't look like pictures but she nearly always does she was putting on the costume sir walter had told me about the wasp creation with the gauzy wings and fluffy flounces the skirt was rather short and showed pretty striped stockings yellow and black sir walter said they were then there were tiny little satin shoes oh she certainly was very gauzy and waspy and pretty miss stana or perhaps i should now say mrs bonstone had a french maid dressing her a well-trained one for her mistress had scarcely to open her lips to give directions once she murmured trop serie and another time she said les gones jaunes her flowers were lovely orchids that nodded like big insects and looked the shade of her gown when she glided from the room the maid who was a merry-looking creature herself stared after her and said with quite an english accent she knows how to get herself up the monkey 
her voice was kind when she said it we dogs don't take much stock in words it's the tone that counts with us i don't believe mrs bonstone would ever be unkind to any one unless they deserved a good scolding in which case i think she could give it well i travelled on behind the wasp gown down to the drawing-room mrs bonstone had greeted me politely when i went in but very dreamily her alert mind was not at present on dogs sir walter stood under the statue of a grecian boy in the lower hall and as usual was the essence of courtesy he came forward to greet me bowing his noble head politely and never saying a word about my not having called sooner escorted me into the fine big room which had been done over with furnishings in which a lot of gold glittered must have cost thousands and thousands i observed sir walter who did not think it good manners to mention prices of things and yet who felt it incumbent on him to say something murmured merely the new man is princely in his generosity where's gringo i inquired anxiously never leaves his master look behind mr bonstone's patent leather shoes sure enough there was old gringo resplendent in a new collar which seemed to worry his neck and panting happily beside a big fire he looked like a big ugly brindled splotch on the white velvet hearth rug but attractive so very attractive and just brimful of originality he wasn't going to turn into a conventional dog just because he had come to live on riverside drive he pricked his rose ears when he saw me and scuffed over to nose or rather to lip me a welcome for his old nose had such a layback that it wasn't the use to him that mine was for example mr bonstone and his wife didn't pay any attention to us they were staring at each other as if they were at some kind of new and agreeable entertainment however the man's keen glance soon fell on us dog show he asked agreeably i heard there was one going on mrs bonstone laughed in a healthy happy way as if she hadn't a care in the world something about us we three dogs standing in the middle of the room politely greeting each other seemed to excite her risibles till she almost lost control of herself or was there something back of us in her mind i guessed the latter by the way she looked at her husband when she caught his arm and said norman let's go in to dinner the butler who stood in the doorway was just announcing this the most agreeable time of the day he was a new man and gave me a frightful stare i placed him as a dog hater mr bonstone and his wife took their dinner in almost profound silence whether it was the presence of the servants in the room or not i don't know but they seemed to be quite happy without talking after dinner they went not back to the drawing-room but to the smoking-room which was furnished in quiet dull colors there were some big leather-covered chairs by the fire and mr bonstone sat down in one 
and resting his head on the back of it stared at the ceiling while his wife wandered about the room neither mr bonstone nor my master smoked and for that i was very thankful for though i can stand the smell of tobacco i like most normal dogs do not care for the smell of anything burning i love strong odors but not when they are on fire we dogs were ordered to go to the kitchen to get some dinner and when we came back the bonstones were talking but not about anything interesting to me so i had a little conversation with gringo we were going under the table which was covered with books and magazines underneath was a fine turkish rug which made the floor very comfy and i was just going to lie down on it when mrs bonstone said politely lie by the fire boy you are an honoured guest i had begged sir walter to leave us for a while he was thoroughly exhausted having had a twenty-mile tramp with mr bonstone that afternoon and though he urged that his duties as host demanded that he stay till my call was over i freed him from all obligations of a social nature and told him to run off for forty winks and come back refreshed gringo and i were not sorry to be alone if i could tell you old fellow i whispered in his soft well set up ear how sorry i've been not to take you about a bit and introduce you but my master needed me and i was consoled by hearing that walter scott was doing the handsome thing by you that dog's right on the level said gringo heartily he's not used to my sort in that castle in scotland where he was born there was a set of dog knobs he never ran with common dogs till i came but as he said himself my dear mistress sets the pace in this house if she accepts you it is my duty to accept you too he has introduced you properly to our set hasn't he i asked eagerly he has done it fine i know the whole bunch from those babies in arms the toy spaniels up to the biggest mastiff that stalks the drive and what do you think of them i hate most of them said gringo stoutly can't make em out on the bowery we're honest if a dog likes you you're made aware of it if he hates you he lies low for you then you think we're deceitful up here i said with a troubled air deceitful ain't the name for it they smile and scrape and give a polite look in the eye but i'm dead sure they're grinning behind my back i'll never like these uptown dogs me for the simple life and honesty i said nothing what he affirmed was partly true but he was over suspicious the trouble was his manners weren't right and his subconscious self told him he was not in his proper milieu by the way he said i note you're as well known as the cops how did you fix that with so many dogs about you've not been here long i don't know i said with a smile it's easy for me to make friends i don't usually stay long in a place and it's get acquainted in a hurry or not at all a sort of dogs that pass in the night fashion some day i want to swap experiences with you he said with pleasure i replied you like your present crib don't you he inquired rather 
but i'm worried about my master just now gringo wasn't listening to me hush up old man for a bit he said anxiously i believe that girl is wasping master again i looked over my shoulder mrs bonstone had wiggled on to the arm of the huge chair her husband was sitting in odd isn't it norman she was saying that you so love this conventional life after all your bohemianism mr norman gave her a queer look from his expressive eyes and said nothing i should think you would hate evening dress and tight shoes and dinners and dances after the prairies and south america and the bowery masters in a cold perspiration he don't like those things he hates em as much as i do said gringo indignantly but he thinks she likes em so he keeps his mouth shut in listening to him i lost mr bonstone's reply and gringo went on wrathfully ain't she the limit she sits there night after night and sticks pins in my poor boss and he thinks she's cute and clever i guess you don't understand her any more than you do the riverside dogs i said looks to me as if she liked him then replied gringo why don't she tell him so instead of wasping his life out gringo i said some ladies often wrap truth all round with affectations till it's like a little lost soul in the centre of a big ball then give me just plain women said the old dog sulkily norman mrs bonstone was saying how would you like to give a ball we've got to return some of the hospitality that's been showered on us poor kid master groaned gringo he goes to those fool shows and watches her dancing and buttons and unbuttons his gloves and chokes his yawns and thinks he's having a good time mr bonstone was speaking stana you may give a ball or a funeral or anything you choose all foot the bill she struck her gaudy heels together and said nothing for a long time her maid came in laid a wonderful evening cloak on the back of a chair and withdrew the sight of it seemed to irritate mrs bonstone for she frowned at it and after a time stretched out her hand pulled the lovely cloak from the back of the chair near her threw it over gringo and me and disdainfully tucked it round us with her foot gringo was nearly dead with the heat of the fire and as he wriggled out of the cloak he muttered wrathfully why don't the boss give her a hauling over the coals down on the bowery she'd get it and be the better for it the way men fetch and carry for the ladies in the elite of the bouve monde makes me sick i snickered at his french then turned my attention to mr bonstone who was saying quietly you've changed your mind about going to that fancy dress affair tonight haven't you i believe i have she said dreamily and she slipped from the arm of his chair to another big one and sinking back in it fixed her eyes on the fire haven't you a farm somewhere near here she asked presently an eager look came into mr bonstone's eyes yes he said shortly i have let's pretend we're the farmer and his wife she said coaxingly i've just been out to the stable and put the hens to bed 
mr bonstone smiled suppose we say hen house he remarked hens as a rule don't sleep in the stable well the hen house she said you've just been milking the cows i can milk said mr bonstone but i don't count on ever doing it myself why not asked mrs bonstone wouldn't pay i'd better do the head work and have a man attend to the cows mrs bonstone pressed her pretty lips together and went on the horses the cows and the hens are all asleep what would the farmer and his wife do to amuse themselves for the evening i know what the farmer would do said mr bonstone he'd tot up his accounts read the paper and go to bed he'd be dead tired and what would i do she'd asked you'd do likewise if you were a real farmer's wife said mr bonstone your feet would be so sore you couldn't stand on them how lovely she exclaimed to be really tired what set you out to talk about this he inquired curiously you'd never live on a farm yes i would she replied earnestly i'm tired of balls i'm tired of the opera i'm tired of dances i'm tired of dinners i'm tired of fine dresses i'm tired of everything i've had i want something new if you want novelty he said breathlessly i've got that farm i never thought you'd go on it i want to go there she said i want to leave here i want chickens and cows and more dogs you'd miss this life he said curtly no no i would not i long for the country the real country let grandmother have this house well ain't she the ice chest observed gringo severely mr bonstone's eyes were going round the room i felt what he was thinking of worldly wise old mrs resterton would be enchanted to preside over this mansion if she comes here he said at last you must come too when you like you are a city girl the country will bore you after a time she made an impatient gesture you don't understand i like what you like you despise bricks and mortar i despise them suppose i haven't money enough to run two houses he said i don't care i can work and she opened out her two tiny hands mr bonstone said nothing and looked down at gringo believe me he's happy muttered the old dog in my ear i see it in his eyes he thinks the wasp is beginning to like him i thought you liked money said mr bonstone after a long time i love it said the wasp promptly heaps of it but i like you better he'll have to do something now said gringo anxiously he's very chilly in his ways a red-hot spark just then flew out of the fire on my coat and i was very much occupied with my little burn for a few seconds when i again turned my attention to the room gringo was on his feet ejaculating excitedly mister's left his chair he's walking fast around the room he's powerfully pleased come on let's join the procession and he gambled to the other side of the table i love to see human beings happy and i trotted after gringo mrs bonstone's face shone like a fairy's and she was softly beating her hands on the arms of her chair never again tell me your master has cold eyes i said to walter scott 
who had just come to the room and stood in the doorway gazing in an amazed and disapproving manner at the cloak on the floor his master's excited face and mrs bonstone's resplendent eyes my dear lady is not going to the ball faltered sir walter she's lost her repose of manner and she's singing tum tum and beating her hands on the chair what would grandmother say if she were here fortunately grandmother is in palm beach i muttered gringo was in high feather as he trailed round the room after his master and i trailed after him he said gleefully thank goodness young missy has quit her fooling she's let mister know she wants to do whatever he wants to do now he won't be so bothered he can get to work to carry out his schemes for improving country life without having to gloom round after her all the time a thought came flashing into my mind oh if my poor master only had his sick wife home again i believe he would look just as blissful as mr bonstone does End of chapter 11